Hello again, everybody. This is Mr. Everything, and I am coming back at you with another Wargaming in Miniature video. In today's video, we're going to continue on with our Battle Group Boot Camp. Now, a quick summary of what we've discussed so far has been a general overview and summary of the rules. We talked about the turn and issuing orders. We talked about movement. We talked about direct fire, uh, small arms, and uh, suppressive fire with small arms. And then we started talking about direct fire with HE and direct fire with armor piercing. Uh, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about indirect artillery fire. The power of artillery cannot be ignored because even while the forces on the tabletop are closely engaged with the enemy, artillery is a weapon capable of winning battles on its own. But despite its destructive power, artillery also has its limitations and certainly cannot be unleashed indiscriminately. Far more common on battlefields is the size depicted in war games is mortar fire, which also uses these rules detailed here. In the following rules, the term guns should be taken to refer to all artillery and mortars. An indirect fire is the only type of firing medium and heavy mortars can use. Targeting artillery and mortars accurately is a complex mission only undertaken by trained specialists in the form of artillery and mortar observer teams and senior commanders. Only units with the artillery spotter special rule can call for artillery fire. A unit with the mortar spotter special rule can call for mortar fire. Uh, artillery spotters can also call for mortar fire. Think of them as like slightly better. Your artillery can do artillery and mortars and your mortar can only do mortar. To call for artillery, it's a multiple step process. To use artillery, follow the steps below. One, you request the artillery fire order. Number two, you check priority. Number three, you make a communications check, which we'll go into detail of all of these. Number four, you position your spotter round. Number five, you roll to see if, the, if it deviates. And then the final step is you fire for effect. And each one of these steps has multiple parts to it. So if you don't get it on the first playthrough of this video, be sure to go back, rewatch it, pause it, grasp it before you move on because the artillery fire can be a little daunting. One was request artillery fire. Okay, before any fire can be called, an eligible spotter must be given the request artillery fire. Okay, this is my artillery spotter, right? So we issue him an order, which I use these little wooden pegs, letting me know that they've been issued an order, right? Because you get a certain number of orders for your side every turn by the die roll, as we discussed back in turns and orders. So one of your handful of orders would go to your artillery spotter. On table guns and mortar teams may not, I'll say it again, may not request artillery fire for their own guns. They still need an observer. So what this is saying is even though these mortars can see the end, they cannot call for fire. Okay, so this guy calls for fire. We issue that order. That's step one. Boom. Done. Then we go to step two. Priority check. If the guns to fire 
are from the additional fire support section in your army list. Okay, we will eventually go over army lists, but that will be in a later video. But in this army list, I just pulled up the British Armored Division Battle Group. That's fine. But if your fire... Okay, we're talking about priority checks. If your fire comes... Okay, see so you have artillery units here, but then there's something called additional fire support. So if the guns are from the additional fire support section of the army list, then the spotter unit must roll a priority check. This can be either first, second, or third priority and is a D6 die roll. You have off-table artillery support request and you got first, second, and third priority and they tell you what the die roll that you need to roll to succeed. In this case, it's two, four, and five, but it varies. Get an off-table artillery support request, you have to pay points for that priority. The score needed to pass the test is given on the army list. If the test is passed, then proceed on to the communications test. Failure means higher command has not authorized the use of the guns at this time. Hard luck. Now, if the artillery that you're calling is from the artillery section, which is the artillery units here of the army list, then the priority check is automatically passed because the guns are not part because these guns are part of the battle group dedicated to supporting this battle and awaiting the call of your observer. Think of it like this. You're building your battle group or your comp group or whatever is actually going into attack. Some of these you're going to have actually deployed on the table and some of them will actually be off table. You got off table artillery and then you also have units here that you'll actually move onto the table with the rest of your battle group. But even though they're off table, they're still considered part of your battle group and they would, you automatically call those. So really the only time you need to even worry about priority checks is if it came from the additional fire support. Okay, step three. So basically that's saying, okay, let's get back to step two. Okay, step two, the priority check. The reason why you check for additional fire support is because those guns are hypothetically supporting multiple battles simultaneously and maybe the senior commander, the battalion commander, the regimental commander, whatever, is saying that those guns are more valuable to fire at a different battle than the one you're playing on your table. Or if you succeed in the role, he's saying that you have access to those guns because you have the priority or he wants you to have the priority. But if the guns are directly under your command because <clears throat> they're part of your battle group, you don't have to roll. They basically give you priority 100% of the time. Okay, the next step is the communications test. Next, the spotter must talk to the guns to give them their target information. This is done via radio or field telephone. The observer chooses how far up the chain of command he will attempt to call fire from. With the communication test getting more difficult, the further up the chain of command, see the additional fire support section of the army list for the role required. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my army list here and we're gonna take a look. Uh, remember that was off table artillery support request. That's the priority, right? Target priority for second and third. But then you have the fire mission request and you decide how far up. We've got brigade battery, divisional battery, corps battery, or army battery. And every army list will have a different list. And in this case, brigade is only a two or better comm test, where a divisional is three or better. Because uh, the brigade only has a couple of battalions 
and uh, there's not a whole lot of radio traffic. But when you start getting up to divisional or core, there's maybe the core has multiple divisions, which has multiple brigades, which has multiple battalions, and maybe they're all trying to call on those guns, so it becomes harder and harder. But the, the advantage of going up the chain is the gun size gets better or the number of guns gets bigger, right? So when you start calling on your army batteries, you might have like the two, two 240s or two 7.2 inch or 8 inch guns, right? Like batteries, like what do you call them? But that's a five or better comm test. Okay, so you get the idea. Additional fire support, you need to do two roles. You have a support request, priority. Then you have mission request based on this, based on how far up the chain you want to go. And that's really your choice as the, as the commander. Now, this die roll can be affected by several specialist units, like a forward signal unit, a wire team, or a dispatch rider. Failure of this test ends the fire mission. Okay, so even if if you if you don't get request, okay, if you don't get priority, it ends. You can stop. If you get priority, then you decide what level you roll the comm test. If you fail, that stops the artillery. So you would just move on to the next person. So failure ends the fire mission due to inability to get to the right information through in time. Communications tests must also be made to on-table guns or batteries to use indirect fire. Next, roll on the appropriate table to discover which guns are available. Okay. So like if you call to, let's do core battery. If you succeed, there's another D6 roll here that tells you which guns are actually available, right? So you could have 25 pounders all the way up to 155s. Basically, it just lets you know which, which guns you could possibly get out of your uh, comm test. If you're calling on table guns, you already know what the guns are. You don't have to worry about picking and choosing. Now let's talk about comm checks real quick. There's a little anecdote here. A battle group's radio network is represented on the battle by communication checks. These are dice rolls that are required to talk to other units via the radio or field telephone. Often, this will be to talk to artillery batteries to direct their fire. A comm check is a D6 roll requiring a set number to succeed. So far, so good, right? Where required number will be noted. But if it is not noted, then the die roll is a default 3+. Plus. There are a number of special rules that can affect communications checks. Communications units can re-roll one failed check per turn. So if you have a unit that has the communications special rule, you can re-roll. A failed check cannot be re-rolled more than once. The re-roll does not cost an order to make that second attempt. So it's just good to have communication units on the table. A wire communication unit Okay, here we go. A wire communication unit can increase a communication check for success to a two, but then once you use that ability, you remove the unit from the table. So it's kind of like a one reroll. And the, by having that unit out there, it gives you that reroll. But once you've used that reroll, you take the unit off the table.
Same thing with a dispatch. If you have a dispatch, you automatically pass the communication test, but you remove the dispatch from the table. Basically, you're sending an actual person to carry an actual message, written message, to the rear where the artillery guns are or wherever, and by doing that, you pull them from the table. Okay, so to be able to use your on-table or off-table directly supported artillery, like anything inside your battle group or bought from the artillery section, like these mortars could have been bought as part of a platoon's support units, right? And uh, even though they're bought with a platoon support unit, they still need an observer and the observer still has to make a communications test to be able to talk to the batteries. And remember, the default number is three or better. Now that we've made contact, uh, or basically, who's making the communications test? The spotter makes a communication test. So he just rolls a die. Uh, he, he might be talking to more than one gun. It doesn't matter. You're only making one roll. You don't roll once for every gun that you're trying to communicate with. You just roll one die. And if you get a three plus, you made it. If you had a dispatch, you automatically make it. If you have communications team, you get to re-roll your uh, communications roll. If you have wire communications, it increases the roll from a three to a two, so it just makes it easier. Remember, ones and sixes, ones are probably always going to fail, and sixes are always going to succeed. All right, so now, position the spotter round. This is the fourth step. Next, place a spotter round marker anywhere in the spotter's line of sight within 70 inches. 70 inches is a long distance okay so it's pretty much as far as you want really so i pulled this out i could use this as my spotter round or you can use uh just a little token maybe with a dot in the middle or something that says spotter round on it or maybe a, a token with a cross here or you can use uh, a puff of smoke, you know, you can, you, can, you can use even little wood pegs like that as your spotter round. You can use whatever, right? Okay, I'm going to use that. So place the spotter round anywhere in line of sight within 70 inches of the spotter. The marker does not have to be placed on an enemy unit. Just a point on the tabletop. So I could put it there, if I wanted, right? I could put it there, 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 or whatever, knowing there's two kind of a kind of a bigger selection of guys, I might put it directly in the middle. You can put it wherever you want. Artillery fires with a grid reference, not at an enemy target. So basically, your artillery uh, spotter is using a map and he's giving grid locations to the guns. And so the grid location is where it's going to land, not necessarily on units. You're not targeting units, you're targeting a map location. The spotter round must be, must be at least 15 inches away from whatever gun is shooting it. Medium mortars, heavy mortars, 75 millimeter howitzers, 8 inch guns, doesn't matter. As long as that spotter round is more than 15 inches away from your guns, you're good. Now, if you remember mortars, or I should say medium mortars, because that's what these are, they have a 10 inch minimum range, but that's okay. When you place spotter rounds, they have to be 15 inches away. If for some reason that spotter round moves within 10 inches of these mortars, then I, 
they fail to fire. We'll get into that under fire for effect. Okay, position the spot around 15 inches away. Done. Next step, number five, roll for deviation, right? Roll to see how accurate the spotter round is. Roll a D6 on the spotter round accuracy table to see where the spotting round lands. So uh, if you look at the table right here, you're rolling a D6 to see how many D6 you roll. So I'm going to roll a die. I roll a 1. A 1 is wild. It's a fumble, right? Misses by 4d6 in a random direction. Okay, so I've got 4d6. To determine the random direction, there's a couple of different methods. The book says there's the d12 method or the d10 method. I personally prefer the d10 method. It's easier. And, and it gives me more of it gives me a 100, uh, um, how am I going to say this? The D10 method gives me an infinite number of directions, where the D12 method only gives me 12 directions. Uh, if you have a D12, and this is the method you want to use, think of it like clock directions, right? Where straight up the table might be 12 o'clock, then that might be 1 o'clock, that might be 2 o'clock, straight across might be 3 o'clock, 4 or 5 directly to the back is 6 o'clock. You get the idea, right? But I don't like that, personally. What I like is to roll a D10, right? And if you're familiar with D10s, they have a fairly sizable arrow, you know, depending on however it lands, it has an arrow pointing in various directions. Uh, and that would be the direction of your deviation, right? So hypothetically, there you go. And you notice how that's just a little bit off, not straight across. It's, it's not 8 o'clock. It's not 9 o'clock. It's about 9.45, something like that, right? So you get a much wider variety of deviation. So we now know I have to roll four dice for distance and a d10 for direction. Now, despite where the rounds are going to land, off-table artillery can never be out of range, right? They can land anywhere on the table. Most of your off-table artillery are the really big guns, um, but there are some smaller guns that you can buy for off-table artillery, but just think of them as close to whatever table edge that that artillery, uh, it can reach the entire table. So don't stress over it. Don't measure. Just, just go with it. So let's go ahead and do an experiment here. I'm going to roll. Now what I, I always tell my players to roll as close to the spotter round as possible, because at least with the at least with the D10, if you don't want to roll all the D6 over there, that's fine. But you want to roll this as close as possible, because it'll make figuring out the clock angle a lot easier. So, um, just as an example, let's say it was the artillery piece. Uh, the spot around was dropped right there, right? I would roll this pretty, I mean, it kind of rolled pretty far. As a referee, what I tend to do is just pick this up and move it as close to it as I can. And then I will roll the distance, seven. Oh my gosh, we got 14 inches. And that's why I have a tape measure. It's off the table, or it's off the camera anyway, right? Yeah, so 14 inches from there would place the artillery over there. But let's hypothetically say I only rolled like maybe a 7, right? So then I take the angle from the die, 
and I take this and I move it seven inches and there you go you got to wear your spotter around because he's calling for fire he said to drop the round here the artillery fires bang right from off table shoo boom and but it the and artillery I don't know if you're familiar with uh, calling for fire in real life but they drop a, a spotter round for him to see where the guns uh, where they're um, targeted where, where you know because they're making a best guess based on where they think they've positioned themselves which you know their compass azimuths the the map orientations and they fire break and it lands there now he has to make a decision based on where that spotter round lands and we're going to talk about fire for effect with the spotter round in the final position this will become the center port point of the ensuing barrage the spotter unit can now fire for effect in which case the guns open up if the spotter round is positioned badly then the spotter unit can cancel the fire mission and the guns will hold their fire ending the fire mission note a fire mission cannot be canceled if a battle group has the rounds on the way special rule remember in this game you do not pre-measure but it is fairly obvious that this is probably within 10 inches of this the commander that has the spotter sees where his spotting round lands and he says hmm I think that's good I'm just gonna say go for it so he decides he's gonna fire for effect so once he's decided that he's gonna fire for effect he's done this guy is finished he doesn't have he's already spent his order he's already received his order for this turn he's done now it moves over to the guns themselves you must now order the guns to commence firing so you've got a couple more blocks you give both of them an order and yes it would take two additional orders each gun that will be firing must be given the order so reduce the number of orders remaining by the number of guns that open fire then follow these steps okay so I've decided I'm going to give each of them a open fire order or a fire order right now when you open fire remember you get two shots just like shooting your rifles you get two shots so determine the number of shots then we roll for barrage accuracy then we allocate direct hits then we allocate pinning hits then we resolve direct hits then we resolve pinning hits then we're done okay so basically you uh, figure out how many shots I mean to, to, to simplify it how many shots do I get four right there's two guns two shots each four we roll to see how accurate they are because one guy's shell might land there one guy's shell might land there another guy's shell might land there you know so we, we're going to roll to see how accurate they are which is just a simple die roll then once we figured out how accurate they are then we allocate the hits to whatever targets okay now to make this a little bit more easy to understand let's say that this American squad actually broke his uh, broke his BAR team off and the infant the, the the remaining six infantry are there so this is the BAR team this is the six infantry and I'm gonna say there's a tank there just to make just to explain what's going on in my example uh, and then when we're done we'll talk about harassing barrage as well okay so number one determine the number of shots 
Using the open fire order, each gun has two shots. So the number of rounds falling is equal to the number of guns firing times two. This applies to off-board artillery, on-board artillery, all of it. Add this and any loader teams which are assisting the barrage and pass their loader test. Use 1d6 for every shot, right? So we got four shots. So there's my four dice. Now we roll for barrage accuracy. Roll all the dice on the barrage accuracy table. Okay, so here, let's, let's roll. There we go. Got a pretty good roll. A one is a miss. The shot is wild, lands somewhere. It has no effect. Like it lands over there, boom, and nothing happens, right? I didn't roll any ones. So two through five, that's everything that's not a one or a six, is a pinning shell. So it lands close enough that... Uh, it rattles their cage. The shell does not hit anything, but lands close enough to harass or worry the enemy. The round may attempt to pin the enemy unit. Perfect. And if I roll a six, it's a direct hit. Okay, so here we go. First thing you do is allocate direct hits. Any unit within 10 inches of the spotter round can be hit by a barrage. So remember, the spotter round lands, and then if you wanted to, you could create like this 10-inch template, or you could just use a tape measure and just say everybody within 10 inches is hit, and everybody, everybody in this group is within 10 inches, so they potentially could be hit. Take any die results of a six and allocate them to a unit starting with the closest unit and working outward. All right, so allocating direct hits. Take any dice result of a six, allocate them to a unit starting with the closest unit. So the six would go there. I have no more sixes. If I did have more sixes, then I would put one on this unit because it's the next closest. And then if I had a third one, I'd put it on that unit. And then if I had a fourth one, I would start my process over and go back to this one. So it's the closer you are, the more, I mean, you're, you're the one that's going to take the most damage. So direct hit, direct hit, direct hit, then back to direct hit, direct hit, direct hit, until you run out. Friend or foe, it doesn't matter. If you've got friendly units in here, they are counted as part of the possible targets. Yeah, if there are more direct hits than units in range, then start again allocating multiple direct hits to the closest unit. Okay, once you get your direct hits allocated, now you allocate pins. Take any pinning die, remember, two to five, and allocate them one at a time to a unit starting with the closest unit to the spotter marker and working outwards up to 10 inches. This includes any units that have already taken direct hits. So the units closest to the marker are likely to take the worst punishment. Again, this includes any friendly units. If there are more pinning hits than units in range, then start again. Same thing. If you get 100 pins, you go pin, 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 and just keep going until you run out. And because I have three pins, there we go. That, that's how the hits are going to work. Okay. Now, the first thing you do is resolve direct hits. Any unit that takes a direct hit resolves damage exactly if, as if they have been hit by aimed fire from high explosive shells. So the shell's HE blast rating, or if the direct hit is against an armored vehicle, use the shell's armor penetration value against the vehicle's side. Okay, because it's not an armored vehicle, it's infantry. Okay, a medium mortar has a four with a four plus. So I'm gonna roll 
four D six. Let's get some D six out here. I'm going to roll four D six from that direct hit looking for fours or better. I got four hits on that unit. Now that unit gets to make four saving throws. Being in the open, he needs fives. Uh, no, he needs sixes or better. Uh, none of them save, so he would take three casualties. And that would be the direct hit. Boop. If it was the art, if it was the direct hit was on a tank, you would use the armor penetration of the HE shell, which in this case is a two, and you would apply it to the side armor of the vehicle, and it would just be like armor piercing, two versus whatever his side armor is. Okay, so now we resolve pinning hits. Any units that take a pinning hit should be rolled exactly as if they were under suppressing fire. Cross-reference the gun's high explosive size, very light, medium, heavy, etc., versus the target type and roll to see if it's pinned and then make a cover save. So a medium mortar is a light weapon, light gun, against infantry, needs a four or better. Against an enclosed armored vehicle, you need a six. So what are we looking at? Four and six. They each have one, so a four there. Possibly pinned. Not pinned, so that would just be blown away. And a six. Not pinned, so don't worry about it. Uh, and then, you know, that round is a dud. Uh, we already did the direct hit. You took three casualties. Uh, now we're going to, um, we're rolling for the pin. We roll a four or better. Now he gets a, he gets another cover save versus the pin. Infantry in the open needs a six. He failed it. He becomes pinned, right? So we would mark him with a pin marker and we'd mark his three casualties. Okay, once we re resolved all the direct hits and all the pins, rounds complete. Once all damage and pinning is resolved, the barrage is complete, the spotter marker is removed. The whole process must be run through again next time the guns wish to fire. So, there's no like, since I fired there, can I make a small adjustment to make it a better... Uh, correction or whatever. No, you would just basically do it again. You would have to give the spotter an order. He would have to pass the communications test. You would place the spotter round. You'd have to roll to see how badly it deviates from, you know, that's probably not going to deviate very far at all. It only deviates 1d6. You get the direction of how far it goes which is now going to be this way. You roll the 1d6, it only going to deviate one inch, right? And then you work your blast from there. So it's kind of like you're, you've, made, you're, you've made your adjustment, but there's no actual leave the spotter around on there and adjust it a certain number of inches every turn. That's not a thing. Okay, so that is the basic general rule of thumb. You got two, you got two halves of artillery. You got the spotter. He's got to make a bunch of rolls to make it happen. And then you got the rolls for the gun to see what kind of effect it has. So now let's go into some special cases. We got the harassment barrage. Instead of calling in fire to destroy the enemy with intense barrages, a spotter can request harassing fire which affects a wider area, but has less chance of causing a direct hit. After positioning the spotter marker, the spotter can state he is calling for harassing fire. Okay, so to be able to put the spotter marker out, he still had to make that communications test. But he makes the communications test, 
He puts the splutter marker out, and then he says, Okay, I'm getting ready to do harassing fire. Resolve the fire as normal, but any direct hits must be re-rolled. If they come up a direct hit again, then this still stands. Allocate direct hits and pinning hits as normal, but any unit within 15 inches of the spotter marker can be affected rather than the normal 10. So basically, by allowing your direct hits to be re-rolled, you're able to increase the radius by 5 inches, which means the area of effect is 30 inches across. That's crazy. Okay, that's harassing. Now, there is something like multiple rocket launchers. You've heard of them. Neville Warfers, etc., Katushas, whatever. During the war, both sides made use of multiple rocket launchers. Oh, yeah, there's the Calliope as well. The Katusha launchers, the German army had Neville Warfers. These weapons have a high rate of fire, but only for a brief time before needing lengthy reloading. They cannot keep up a sustained fire mission like conventional artillery. To represent their frightening but brief firepower, multiple rocket launchers count as firing three times for every shot. So instead of multiplying the number of guns by two, multiply it by six. Okay, so if these were like Nebelwerfers, that would be 12 dice I'm rolling. After firing, multiple rocket launcher must then miss two entire turns while it reloads. So you'd mark it maybe with a die or a counter or something, you know, saying that it's in the process of reloading. And just maybe I would put a couple of them down and then every turn remove one and unable to use it until they don't have any tokens or something like that. Whatever you want to do, however you want to figure it out. So if it fires on turn one, it will miss turn two and three, and then it'll fire again on turn four. So soft skin or static launchers does not require resupply vehicle. It is assumed it has enough extra ammunition stored nearby. On armor vehicles, a resupply truck is required. Okay. That's multiple rocket launchers. Now let's talk about additional fire support. Additional fire support, as well as your battle group having its own artillery, guns dedicated to supporting it or covering the sector, there is also other artillery available via the army lists. We talked about this earlier. These are off-table guns and mortars, which can be called upon as needed by the forward observer, a battle group can include additional fire support as requests of either first, second, or third priority. The higher the priority, the greater the chance that high command will agree to allow you to have those guns diverted away from their missions to help you. If the priority request role is successful, then you're in luck, and there are guns available. You must now choose how far up the chain of command to go. The higher you go, the larger the caliber, but the harder they are to communicate with and get them in time. This is represented by the communications role. If the Ford Observer passes this role, then there is a battery on standby ready to open fire. Roll again on the appropriate table for the number of and size of guns that will be able to fire. We already went over that. Note, a mortar spotter requesting additional fire support will only be given access to the listed mortars, regardless of how far up the chain of command his request goes. Because remember, um, artillery spotters can get both, where a mortar spotter can only get mortars. If, during the course of the request, a test, priority, or communications is failed, then no guns and the order ends. Note that the request for fire support is only used once it has been accepted and guns fired. It can be reused as many times as necessary in order to get through. Okay, what, what that is, is when in your army list, when you buy this barrage, you're buying a single barrage, not barrage for every turn of the game. So 
when the spotter calls in for that additional fire support, he either gets it or he doesn't. If he gets it, you can mark it off, it's done, he's through. If he doesn't get it, he can attempt the next turn to try to get it. Because you can, you can attempt to get it until it's used up. You can buy multiple requests. So on some of the scenarios, I'll notice that it says two priority one missions. Yeah, a battle group can include multiple fire mission requests, even different priorities, however you want it. Now, the communications check can be affected by various special communications units. A communication unit can re-roll a failed check. A wire will reduce it to two. A dispatch rider will make it automatically pass. But priority checks are not communications checks. They either pass or fail with no re-rolls allowed. So once you get your priority mission re-rolled or rolled, then you can do the communications check which you might decide to use wire, you might decide to use a, a runner. You, you gotta make all that decision before you roll the die. Okay, we pretty much already went over all that. But now, new things. Pre-registered target. As well as firing at targets of opportunity, artillery can be pre-ranged and targeted on a single point, usually a location of importance to the enemy or a suspected route of the enemy advance. Once ranged in, guns already have the calculations to hit that point, so they can react quickly and accurately. A pre-registered target should be posi positioned using a sketch map. Um, whenever I run a game, I'll print out the scenario map, or the map out of the book, or whatever, uh, so that the players, every player will have their own copy of the map. So if it's a multiplayer game, they can discuss strategy on the map or what have you. But it also allows you to pencil in on that map where your pre-registered target is located. You notate that before any units are deployed on the table. So you can't say, oh, he's set up in that town? Okay, that's where I'll put my pre-registered target. No. No. <laughs> To fire guns at the pre-registered target, no observer is required. Do not roll for spotter round accuracy or communications. The barrage will automatically be centered on that point. Go straight to fire for effect. So you don't have to worry about placing a spotter round. Well, you can. You could say, you could tell your opponent, oh, by the way, I put a pre-registered target right there, so let's roll for the blast. Because it won't deviate. That's where it's going to hit. Resolve the fire as normal. This still requires an order for each gun that wishes to fire. So even if you have a pre-registered target, you still have to give those orders to the guns. Any on-table guns and mortars can also hit pre-registered targets in this manner. If you've got a pre-registered target uh, on a bridge somewhere and uh, your, your FO has been killed or maybe he's off gallivanting somewhere else on the table, you can still fire your on-table mortars at that spot. That's pretty good. That's pretty awesome. But once your opponent realizes, this is me just saying out loud, once your opponent realizes that he's under a pre-registered target, it would behoove him to get the hell out of there. Okay, timed barrages. Another form of additional fire support is a timed barrage. These are fire missions pre-arranged before the start of the battle. The battle group commander must write down which turn his timed barrage will arrive. He can write this down after deployment but before the game begins. He must also mark the point on the map on the table that his barrage is aimed at just as if it was a pre-registered target. You mark it on the map before deployment. Once you see the deployment, then you can decide what turn it's going to come in at. At the start of the noted turn, the entire barrage hits. No orders are used and it cannot be canceled. Resolve it straight away 
using the standard artillery rules. A timed barrage is a one-use weapon. Once it has been fired, it is completed and cannot be used again. Although, you as a player may have more than one timed barrage because you might have bought them twice or three times. Timed airstrike. Just as with the timed barrage, there is an air attack mission prearranged before the game. And the battle group commander should write down which turn this aircraft will arrive. At the start of the turn on which the aircraft arrives, place the model on the table edge. At any point on the commander's turn, the aircraft will race to its target and drop its payload of bombs. This requires no orders and cannot be canceled. Resolve the bombing using the standard rules for air attacks, which we have not gone over yet. The aircraft is mission complete and then removed from the game. Note, the aircraft can be engaged by enemy AA fire during the turn by using reaction orders as normal. Unless this scenario being played states differently, timed airstrikes still take place even if bad weather has canceled all other forms of air support. Yeah, we haven't really gotten into any of the weather and stuff like that, low cloud cover, etc. But uh, if you have a timed airstrike and you bought that as part of your army list, and then at the start of the game, you guys roll weather and it's like completely overcast and there's no air attacks, you'll still get the timed airstrike. Counter battery fire missions. Both sides have many guns and some of these can be dedicated to seeking out and harassing the enemy's guns firing over the tabletop. Counter battery fire missions can only be used against enemy off-table batteries. They cannot be used against enemy guns on the table. If the enemy is going to open fire with off-table guns, simply interrupt him and declare a counter battery mission. Roll a d6. If the result is greater than the required score, see your army list, the off-table battery cannot fire, and no orders are used. Counter-battery fire missions are only used when they are successful, so you can continue to attempt a counter-battery mission until it works. You may include more than one counter-battery mission, and any number may be used each turn. Okay, so with that basically is saying is on your army list you might it might say that you have two counter battery missions and then when your opponent says i've got these uh, guns that are off the table and i'm going to shoot them and they're going to come in you can say hold up buddy i got counter battery and then you roll in your counter battery and if you succeed those guns can't fire then he goes, oh, dang it, okay, well, then I'll shoot over here, and I'll call for these guys, and I'll get these guys to shoot, and you'll go, hold up, buddy, I got another counter battery, and you roll, and you succeed. But if you fail to counter battery, he'll still go ahead and shoot and fire on you, and then on the following turn, he'll say, well, I'm going to shoot this unit, and say, no, I have a counter battery that I failed last turn, so I'm going to use it this turn. You get the idea. Okay, let's talk about artillery support. Heavy artillery is a weapon that decides the outcome of war. It had limited use, certainly during World War II, as a tactical battlefield weapon. Artillery's main role is to pound the enemy day and night, to interdict their lines of supply, harass the troop movements and reinforcements, and generally make life in and behind the lines as difficult as possible by constantly keeping the enemy under fire or the threat of fire. It has a long-term morale sapping effect. As a tactical weapon, reacting to enemy moves, hitting the routes of advancing or retreating, or individual firing positions, it was mortars that best fulfilled that role. Mortar batteries had the direct links to units on the front line and were quicker to react to rapid changing battlefields. The artillery was controlled by specialist forward observers and which were not that many. 
Basically, there, there's a lot less than what the army lists allow and who are too valuable to be placed in directly harm's way on the battlefield. It was better to find a church steeple a few miles behind the uh, front and have big binoculars. In, ta in a tactical game of platoon and company-based actions, heavy artillery is problematic because once those big guns get going, your battle is effectively over. You cannot fight an engagement in the midst of a big bombardment because basically everybody on the table has to take cover. Rather than exclude them, these rules have tried to deal with this problem in various ways. Firstly, dedicated artillery guns are expensive in points and low in battle rating. So basically, you spend a lot of points and you don't get rewarded by increasing your battle rating. Too many and you'll rapidly have to imbalance that will make your battle group brittle and prone to breaking. They are, of course, powerful weapons in return, but the vagarities of comms tests and counter-battery fire missions means they're also unreliable. They become even more unreliable when brought as additional fire support, but correspondingly far cheaper in points. As with all fire in the game, each barrage rolled for isn't literally the number of shells landing. It's an abstraction to represent a short stonk as a general area of the table. How heavy and accurate that stonk is is really up to the dice. Roll lots of d6 and it might well have been a heavy, long barrage causing widespread destruction. Lots of ones and maybe only a few rounds actually got fired. Artillery is by far the most complex weapon of the World War II battlefield to try and recreate. Firing the guns accurately was, without the aid of computers, and time a time-consuming task. It is not the case that a Ford observer would quickly get to his radio, if it worked, to his guns, and be on target, and firing barrages in a few minutes. Generally, the guns were pre-aimed at a village or a town or a hill, not a single tank or a machine gun team. But to include all the difficulties of firing artillery would make it all the more useless on our tactical battlefields, which would be perverse, even if authentic. The rules try to offer a flavor of artillery impact, not a simulation. Okay, so that was a long video, in my opinion. It took me quite a while to record. Uh, I went back and forth with these rules, uh, trying to figure out the best way to relate them to you. I pretty much stuck with the way it's worded in the rules because I don't want to pervert it. I'm going to do a quick summary so that we can maybe all grasp this together. Okay, we have targets in the open. We have mortars in a position ready to fire. We have a spotter on the table. This, and we're, we're talking about on-table artillery. And we're also talking about direct support, not those additional support. First thing you need to do is request artillery by giving him an order. So we issue the spotter the request artillery order and we either use priority or we skip priority. In this case, we're going to skip priority because it is a direct support element. If we had to roll the priority, we would check in our army list the target number for first, second, or third priority mission. But because we're not using the priority missions, we're doing direct. We can say the priority is automatic. So then we have to make a communications test to see if they hear the radio or if the wire is not cut or, you know, they can hear the ring of their telephone from the spotter. The communications test on a, 
on a table is normally three or better, which is usually a pretty good percentage. What is that, about 66% chance it will happen? There are a couple of modifiers to the communications check. If I have a communications unit on the table, I get to re-roll that. If I have a wire communications unit, I can discard the wire communications unit to change that to a two or better. If I have a dispatch unit on the table, I can discard the dispatch unit to make that automatic. I don't have any of those, so I roll a die. Uh, I need a three or better, I get a three. Communications test succeeds. When the communications test succeeds, that means I can tell the mortars where I want them to fire. I say I want them to fire right there. That's my spotter round. Then I have to see where the spotter round lands. You roll a die to see how badly it deviates. On a five, two to five, it misses by two dice. And you've got to roll a directional dice. So I roll a directional dice. It's going this way. How many inches? Three inches. Not very far. That's, that's a good roll. So we take our ruler. We move it three inches. And that's where the center of the barrage is. I can do a fire for effect, which is a 10 inch radius, and we'll roll to see if we get direct hits and pins, or I can choose to do harassing fire, and then in that case, it'll be a 15 inch radius, and any direct hits will have to be re-rolled. I didn't go, I didn't say this because we haven't really gotten into the special rules yet. Uh, there is a special rule called artillery spotter, which we already know you have to be an artillery spotter to call for fire. But there is also something called an artillery spotter plus, which means it, it says artillery spotter and then it has a plus sign next to it. They can re-roll the distance dice when rolling for scatter, not the directional die. So you don't re-roll the directional die ever. But if I rolled a 12, let's say, I could re-roll that and then get the three. And you have to you have to accept whatever the second. It's not a roll it again and see which one is better. No, you have to, if you decide to re-roll, you have to accept the second roll. Okay, so I've decided to fire for effect. You count your tubes, and then you multiply it by two, unless it's a multiple rocket launcher. You multiply it by two. If it's multiple rocket launcher, then you multiply it by six. So, But in this case, since I'm multiplying it by two, I got two per gun. I'm going to roll four dice. I roll on the artillery barrage accuracy table. A one is a miss. Two to five is pin. And a six is a direct hit. Uh, okay, I got a couple of misses. And I got a couple of pins. Now, the pins have to be applied to the closest unit first. This one is the closest. This is the second closest. Working your way out from the center. And uh, if you have more than you have units, then you start over and do it again. And then you resolve your direct hits, which in this case I had none. But then you resolve your pinning hits. And you do that just as if it was suppressive fire under suppressing fire because it is considered a light gun uh, the infantry will need fours or better to pin and the enclosed armored fighting vehicle you will need a six to pin okay so four or six we roll nope that did not pin and a six that did not pin but hypothetically, let's just say hypothetically that I did roll a six and that would cause a pin. Okay, pinned units can still make armor or uh, cover saves. Okay, and because it was a vehicle and it required a six to pin it, it doesn't get a cover save. It's in the open. Uh, infantry get cover saves in the open. But then again, they're pinned on four or better. So he would become pinned, 
we would mark him with a pin marker and that would be the end of the barrage and that would be what you call rounds complete both of them are marked with orders he's marked with an orders that took three orders out of your allotment for that turn all right now hopefully that helped you understand artillery in battle group it definitely helps me understand it by going through it a couple of times and um be sure to stay tuned to my channel. I will be going over future aspects of the game like morale and the battle rating system in the next video. And then after that, we'll be talking about special rules, uh, which is kind of a, a long chapter, mainly because there are so many different special rules. All right, and I'll see you in the next video.